For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. Our Father, we pause this morning in your holy presence. We were, as Paul described to Titus, dead in our sins, foolish, enslaved to various loss, but in your mercy and grace you rescued us that we might be different people. Thank you that your grace not only saves us and secures us, but it sanctifies us as we depend and learn to grow in grace. So I pray today that as a result of our time in Scripture, we will love you more fully, that we would follow you more passionately. Help me, Father, to rightly divide your word of truth. Without you, I can do nothing, but with you, all things are possible. May the Lord Jesus be lifted up and glorified, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to take your Bibles. This is Reformation Sunday, as it's commonly called, and turn to Paul's letter to Titus. Paul's letter to Titus. This week marks a very significant time in the history of Christianity. It's the 505th year that launched the Reformation, an event that took place on October 31st, 1517, that shook the world and continues to shake the world. Here's a picture of Martin Luther, the one who took that billet, and he nailed it to the door of the church in Wittenberg, 95 theses, 95 assertions, where he documented what the Roman church taught and what the Bible taught and how they were diametrically opposed. I have a love-hate relationship with Martin Luther. There's aspects of him that are very difficult for me to stomach, some of the anti-Semitic statements that he made. But I know that God uses fallible, sinful people to sometimes accomplish his purposes. And I am grateful for the protests that he made on this particular day at the Castle Church there in Wittenberg, Germany. 95 assertions. It was a defiant protest, but it was a sincere call to invite his Roman Catholic brethren to leave what they had embraced and to turn back to the Holy Scripture. Now, Luther had in preceding months a life-changing experience. He learned of the simple gospel of grace, that man could not merit heaven, he could not earn heaven, and he observed the great abuses of the Roman church that were leading men into a destiny without the living God. The word reformation is from the Latin word refinare that literally means to renew. And it was Martin Luther's intention to remove the impurities of the church and to renew it. Of course, with time, the term reformation has taken on different nuance. And of course, it would be less than accurate to say that Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation because there were men before him who really planted the seeds. Many of you know John Wycliffe. He's called the morning star of the Reformation. He lived centuries before, and he planted the seeds that influenced countless, countless numbers of people. He told the popes of his day, the cardinals of his day, the bishops of his day, that the standard by which they were to evaluate behavior and truth and doctrine had to be the Scripture alone. That didn't go over too well, and so Wycliffe was arrested. He was condemned as a heretic. And Pope Gregory XI, well, he was so agitated with him that even after he died, he, uh, he hired another pope, or another pope took his place, and he shared with him all of his discontent. And the pope that took his place was a pope named Pope Martin V, and Pope Martin V was also agitated with Wycliffe 
and these Roman Catholics who were leaving the church and being converted to really biblical doctrine. So he had his body exhumed. He had his bones burned and his ashes spread in some local river, as if that made a difference. Of course, there were other godly men that the Lord used. John Huss, he was, again, a great man of God who challenged the Pope of his day that you must return to Scripture. He taught that a man was saved by grace alone through faith alone, and that the Roman church had departed from that, especially in their use of indulgences. And so in 1412, he was arrested by Pope John XXIII. He was imprisoned. They had a mock trial, and then they burned him alive at the stake. His last words were these, Lord Jesus, I endure this cruel death for you. I ask you to have mercy on these my enemies. And we've not even begun to mention the many other believers who were impacting the day, who were not a part of the Reformation in the strictest sense. There were always a remnant of Bible-believing independent churches just like this that were never a part of the institutional church. We think of the Reformation simply of those who left Catholicism, but understand there were scores of congregations across the planet that had been meeting in various locations and places since the first century that were preaching the Bible. But since the institutional church and the church with the largest impact in the world was the Roman Catholic Church, indeed, it's right to say that the Protestant Reformation gets the press that it needs. Now, this morning, I want us to think about this man who at the age of 33 had a fire in his soul and changed the course of history. And I want you to see from Titus chapter 2 some of the basic tenets of the Reformation. There's a window behind me, and on this stained glass, it was always my dream if we ever uh, built a church to have a... uh, a stained glass with the five solas of the Reformation. And so I designed this and gave it to a stained glass artist and she created it. And, and yet I've noticed in recent days, I've had more people ask me, now tell me what language is that? It, someone asked me recently, is that Spanish on the front of your pulpit? And I said, no, that, that's actually Latin. And I don't laugh at them. See, that's a good problem to have. We have many new Christians in this fellowship where this is all spanking brand new to them. And it's good that they ask questions. It's an arrogant, prideful heart that cannot ask questions and learn. So I hope you never stop asking questions. I hope I never stop asking questions. I want to grow further in the Lord. Now, to set the context for this letter and for this paragraph of Scripture that we're going to focus in, where if you look at it carefully, to some degree, all five solas of the Reformation are mentioned. Let me give you the broader context. In chapter 1, if you know Titus, he deals with the qualifications for leadership in the church. Sadly, these qualifications are much ignored in our day, and so there are men who are brought into leadership in the church who shouldn't be there for the simple reason they're not qualified. So chapter 1 deals with the characteristics of leadership. Chapter 2 deals with the characteristics of the members. And he highlights five different groups of people. You should underline them in your Bible. In verse 2, older men. He describes what older men should be like. Some of you are what the Scripture calls older men. You say, how old do you have to be to be an older man? 60, according to the Scripture, 60. So if you're 60, you're an older man. Anthony's shaking his head over there. Amen. Mm Amen. Then in verse 2, he says older women. How old is an older woman? 60. So you're an old woman if you're 60, all right? Uh, Then he mentions young women in verse 3, young men in verses 6 through 8, and then bond slaves in verses 9 and 10. And the focus of the first 10 verses is a picture of what Christians should be like in the local church. What is to be the lifestyle of the committed, born-again, blood-bought member of a local assembly? But then in verses 11 through 15, he deals with the motivation behind their behavior. He answers the question, why? In the first 10 verses, what is to be the lifestyle? And in this paragraph, why is this to be your lifestyle? Why are we to live this way? And again, what it is that produces godly older men, 
older women, younger men, younger women, and bond slaves is indeed the grace of God. Sola gratia, you'll see it on the window behind me. It means grace alone in Latin. And many of the terms that we use in Christianity are from Latin because for a thousand years, the Latin Bible was certainly almost exclusively the only Bible that was available in terms of translations with a few exceptions. And so sadly, when the language went dead, the average person was dependent on the scholar to hear it read and to hear it interpreted. In either case, what we find here are the core beliefs of the Reformation. I want to begin by reading Titus chapter 2. I hope you've brought a Bible. Follow along starting in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority, let no one disregard you. Now, before we dig into the finer dimensions of the passage, I want you to think about the two appearings of Christ that are highlighted in this portion of Scripture. He mentions two appearings, the first appearing in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, circle that verb, it has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And then he mentions a second appearing in verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing there is a noun of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. This noun appearing is the Greek word epiphania, and you can hear in it our English word epiphany. Some churches follow a liturgical calendar, and so they would speak, for instance, of Epiphany Sunday. I'm not against a liturgical calendar, but I am against a church that is built on liturgy for the simple reason is that the scripture doesn't say to read liturgy, it says to read the scriptures, teach the word. And in most liturgical churches, there's an absence of Bible teaching and people say words that may be rich in theology, but they are blind as to their meaning. But Epiphany Sunday, of course, highlights the Magi where they come to see the one who had appeared, the Lord Jesus, God incarnate. So in verse 11, he tells us the grace of God has appeared. Notice it's a past tense. He's looking back to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In verse 13, he's looking forward. He speaks of a future appearing, an appearing in glory when Christ will come again. The first appearing dealt with the penalty of sin. The second appearing will deal with the very presence of sin. Where in a moment's time, we will be translated and transformed. This mortality will put on immortality, and we will receive a glorified body. And in between those two appearances, in verse 12, he speaks of the present age, where we learn of God's grace that is able to deliver us from the power of sin. And if you think about it, as I highlighted it at our last Lord's table, we do this every time we celebrate the Lord's table. On the one hand, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, he quotes Jesus, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So twice over, Jesus underscores that we celebrate the Lord's table in remembrance of him. So on the one hand, we are remembering his first appearing. But on the other hand, he'll say in verse 26 of that chapter, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're looking ahead to his second appearing. And in the interim, Paul asks the church at Corinth, and by extension us, us to examine ourselves. We are to live between those two appearings. Now, on your outline there, and if you're new, there's an outline in your bulletin. If you're live streaming, you can download it and print it out. There are five seminal statements that describe the grace of God and really Reformation theology. The very first concerns the sovereign nature, the sovereign nature of God's grace. Look, if you will, now at verse 11. Four, circle that word, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. There's a connection here. 
There are different words in the Greek New Testament that are translated to English as for. This particular conjunction, gar, is what we would call, linguists would call, an explanatory for, for. In other words, he's giving an explanation of how the people that he's described in the first 10 verses can become that way. And so uh, Paul tells us that uh, he has appeared, and what is it that has appeared? The grace of God. What we need to become the kind of members that he has described is namely the grace of God. It's not man's grace, it is God's grace. It's rooted in the Lord God, and it must be. Why? Because the Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2. Dead people have no ability to respond. And spiritually speaking, we were as dead as a corpse. And yet God brings together different circumstances, different trials, different blessings, different people. And he brings us under the call and the exposure of the gospel that we might be saved. May I remind you, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, after Adam sinned, it was not man seeking after God. It was God seeking after man. God comes into the garden. He says, Adam, where are you? That was God's initiative. That was God loving Adam. And the fact that the grace of God that brings salvation is God's initiative reminds us that the salvation, if you've been saved, it's not your work. It's God's work. Salvation is not a work of man for God. Salvation is a work of God for man. And it must be because of what we were like in the deadness of our sin. When Paul in the book of Romans, beginning in Romans 1.18 through virtually the end of chapter 3 to 3.20, through 3.20, he unfolds every section of humanity. And he describes whether it's the highly religious man or whether it's the privileged Jew or whether it's the pagan Gentile, we all suffer from the same problem. And having arraigned each group like an attorney, he gives a summary statement. Listen to this summary statement in Romans 3, starting in verse 10. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Now listen to these words. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He's giving a description as he strings these Old Testament passages together to describe what we are like by nature. And he highlights here our tongues, our lips, our mouth, our feet, our eyes. Why? Because he wants to emphasize that every, fa- every aspect of man has been tainted by sin. This is what is commonly called the total depravity of man. Now, sadly, the doctrine of total depravity is often misunderstood. So what do we mean when we say that a man is totally depraved? Are we saying that he is as mean as he could be? Certainly not. Some of you could be a lot meaner than you are, but you shouldn't be. He's not saying that and don't even try, but he is saying that man is so infected by sin that while he may not be as bad as he can be, he is as bad off as he can be. It's not that a lost man can't be good, but he's not as good as he should be. And so the doctrine of total depravity, it speaks of our corruption, it refers to the extent of our sin, that every aspect of man's facilities have been, faculties have been infected by sin. He's dealing with the extent of our sin, not necessarily the degree of our sin. There's a germ within you. Why? Because you sinned in and with Adam. And so from God's perspective, there's none good. People say, well, I just follow my heart. Well, God says this through the prophet Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In fact, this morning, if we could take every evil thought that you've ever thought, just forget what you've done, just the things that you've thought, and we could project them on the screens behind us, you'd never want to come back in this building. You see, we are by nature sinful. 
the intent, God says in Genesis 8, 21, the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. We think of Hitler. He's not an anomaly. He's not some phenomenon. He is what you and I could be if we went far enough down that carter of sin. We saw an expression this week, a heinous expression in the great state of Maine. An awful thing that happened. You say, well, I would never do that. You could. That's your capacity. Psalm 51 says, I was shaped or I was conceived in iniquity. By nature, we are sinners. An apple tree doesn't bear, an apple tree is not an apple tree because it bears apples. It's an apple tree because by nature it is an apple tree. It produces the fruit that it produces because that's what the nature of an apple tree is. And because our nature is sinful, and it's sinful because when Adam sinned, we sinned in and with Adam. The Bible affirms the federal headship of the race and our participation with Adam. We're born with this fallen, depraved nature. And so he says, there is none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. And again, God came into the garden. He says, where are you, Adam? You would have thought Adam would have said, oh God, where are you? Please help us. But that, of course, is not what happened. He was hiding. He was not seeking God. He was hiding from God. And the only reason any of you, myself included, have ever sought God is because of God's sovereign grace. It began with him. And if it didn't begin with him, you'd never see the inside of heaven. Dead people can't respond on their own. John said it this way in his first epistle. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then he'll say, we love because he first loved us. Listen, it doesn't matter if you were six or 60 years of age when you were converted. The initiative began with God. Paul will say it this way to the church at Corinth. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, some of you may hear verses like this, and you say, yes, this was me. I definitely was not seeking God, and he got a hold of me. But others of you are thinking, well, it wasn't that way for me. I can't remember when I didn't seek the Lord. Well, listen, there are little children in this church, like my children, who at a very young age sought after the Lord. They wanted to find out what it meant to be saved because God worked in their heart. And often he works in response to the prayers of the parents. When parents really, truly understand the deadness of that precious little so-called angel that you bring home from the hospital, that that little angel is a sinner by nature and dead, that God has to move in that child's heart, you begin to get on your knees even when the child is in the womb. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I sought the Lord before I was saved. No one invited me to church. I came here on my own. I started reading Christian apologetic books about the faith and why it was true. That's why I am here. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reason you even had an inkling to want to come to a Bible-believing church, the reason you even had a desire to read some book on the apologetics of the Christian faith is because God began to work in you. And if you don't think that way, then you have a distorted view of grace. Paul said it this way in Romans 9 and verse 16. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. I'm just trying to help us to see that it is God's grace that ordered our steps. Whether you were raised in a godly home and you can't remember when you didn't hear about Jesus Christ or whether or not you were raised in a totally pagan environment. It was always God to the rescue. And so God's grace has appeared. Paul underscores this truth to Timothy. Listen to these words in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He says, it is God who is the one, quote, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. 
but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior. There it is again. By the appearing, the epiphania of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So here in Titus 2, Paul is telling us that light showed up in the midst of a dark world. And again, unless God shines the light into a dead heart, no one will ever be able to see. And that's why it's important that when you hear the truth and the spotlight of the truth illumines your mind, you should respond to the truth. Because this didn't start with you, it started with God. And so Paul is commissioned by the Lord Jesus to do what? We're told in Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes, the Gentiles, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. And so when you hear the gospel, when the light of its truth is shown in your heart, respond, why? Because God may stop at some point shining his light. God is long-suffering, but Jesus said, while the light is among you, respond to the light, believe in the light. And he went on to warn those people who had seen incredible miracles done in their very presence. They had seen the revelatory light of the Messiah, the very miracles that Isaiah and other prophets said he would do. And because of their unwillingness to respond, because they thought they were on their schedule and they could get around to it when they wanted to get around to it, it says, he, God, hardened their heart. He, God, blinded their eyes and stopped their ears that they might not believe and be saved. This is why Paul warns in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, for he says, at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul is pleading with his readers. He understands that not all who were quote unquote members of the Corinthian church were true believers. That's why he comes to the end of the epistle. And he says, test yourself to see if you be of the faith. And I know that not everyone who's a member of Community Bible Church is genuinely converted. I understand that. Why? Because Jesus taught me that. He said the wheat and the tear shall be together. Now, certainly, they have to know what the gospel is to be considered a member. But people can buffalo you, and they can buffalo themselves. They can think because they know the plan of salvation that they've met the man of salvation. So here is Paul, and he's quoting Isaiah 49. And if you know that chapter of Scripture, he quotes it because he is underscoring the need to respond immediately. The acceptable time will not last forever. So understanding the sovereign nature of God's grace should make us very, very prayerful in this process of evangelism. We should be praying for opportunities. I'm praying for next Sunday. I'm praying that God would use me. I I met a gentleman yesterday named Benjamin. He was very open. And when I spoke to him about the fact that you could know that you're saved, that was an entirely new truth to him. And of course, he he said, I I wanna come to this fall festival, but then he said to me, I wanna come to your friend day. I said, you should come, because I'm going to explain the simple plan of salvation. And if the only people in the 11 o'clock service who are here are you, and I know this represents a majority of believers, well, fine, we'll be better equipped. But I want us to bring some lost people. You say, how will I get a lost person? Invite 10 people this week. Prayerfully invite 10 people. Maybe one will come. And maybe you'll see someone that you'll meet in eternity and they'll walk up to you and they'll say, thank you for being obedient to the Lord. I heard of the sovereign grace of God. He ordered my steps through you that I might become a believer. Now, when you understand that God's grace is sovereign, you don't take credit for the salvation of people because you know it is a sovereign God who orchestrates the circumstances to make these things happen. You realize that all that you are and that all you do is an expression of God's grace. Indeed, the Westminster Confession of Faith had it right on this point, that uh, the chief end of man is to glorify God. Now, the Humanist Manifesto would say the chief end of man is to glorify man. 
but God alone is to be glorified. And so here on the stained glass window under the cross, soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. And the reformers underscore the truth that no priest, no pope, no bishop, no cardinal, no canonized saint could receive glory that God alone deserves glory because he alone is the author of salvation. Sola Deo Gloria is the teaching that God alone should be glorified. Now, beyond the sovereign nature of God's grace that leads us to say to God be the glory, secondly, there's the saving nature of God's grace. The saving nature of God's grace. Again, we're told here in verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, remember, there are three big words that relate to a clear consideration of our salvation. There's the word justice, there's the word mercy, and there's the word grace. The word justice is a word that describes God giving us what we do deserve. What do we deserve? Death, eternal death. I hope you understand that the nature of grace underscores that God had no debts to pay. God owed us nothing but justice. But you don't want justice. God didn't have to become a man and die for us, but God, because he wanted to show mercy and grace, sent his son. Now, sometimes the word mercy and grace can be used interchangeably. Of course, words define their meaning in context, but sometimes they're strictly differentiated. And so while justice describes what we do deserve, mercy can describe uh, another concept altogether, and it's God withholding the justice that we have. It's God not giving us what we deserve. And you are here today, some of you, you're under the mercy of God. He is withholding his justice. He is long-suffering, but there'll come a time when the dam of God's mercy will break to his justice if you don't respond. But God is long-suffering, but he'll not strive with you forever. There will come a time when you must make a decision, and not to decide is to decide. So justice is God giving us what we do deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve, but grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. God is bestowing upon us righteousness and forgiveness. In mercy, he stays his justice and grace. He showers his great blessing. And so we speak here of these five solas, and one of them is sola gratia, grace alone. And this is the issue, this is the sola, so to speak, that reverberated in the heart of Martin Luther. In 1510, it was his lifelong dream to leave Germany and go to Rome to visit the church. And he expected there to find nuns and priests and bishops and cardinals, and yes, the Pope to be godly, passionate people for the living God. And what did he find? Just the opposite. He went on that trip to a place called Scala Sancta. Some of you went with me to Rome on some mission trips. And here's a picture of what is called the Holy Stairs. According to tradition, Helena in the fourth century had these stairs transported from Jerusalem to Rome. It is said that these are the stairs that Jesus walked up as he stood before Pilate's Bema seat. It's a twisted myth, it's not true. Even the very steps themselves do not represent anything that's native to Israel. With that all said, It was taught in Luther's day, and it is still taught in this day, and some people falsely believe it, that if you would go up these steps on your knees, all the way up to the top, and some would add saying the full rosary on each step, which is what many people do. If you ever prayed the rosary as I did as a child, it took some time, (laughs) that you would be guaranteed a spot in heaven. So Luther goes, he climbs each step one at a time, he kisses each step, and he gets to the top, and his soul is still empty and frustrated. And then, of course, some time transpired, and what really yanked at his cord was a preacher pictured here by the name of Johann Tetzel. Luther had heard that Pope Leo X had hired him. He... um, 
uh, hire this Dominican friar to sell indulgences. If you've ever been to St. Peter's Cathedral, it's a glorious building. In fact, on the floor are marked all the great cathedrals of the world. And the last one that's marked there is Westminster Cathedral. Some of you have been there in London. It's just huge. You turn around and it's another 20 yards to the back wall. It is the largest church building in the world. And of course, the dome is incredible. And of, sadly, the, the dome caved in. And Leo X needed money. So he hires Tetzel and he makes an agreement. You sell these indulgences, you'll be able to keep half and the other half comes to the church at Rome. And so like a used car salesman with a passion in his heart, he's selling these indulgences. He's selling plenary indulgences. A plenary, a full indulgence said that for a sum of money, you are absolutely guaranteed that at the point of death you would bypass purgatory, another man-made doctrine not found in Scripture. You would bypass purgatory and go directly to heaven. And of course, here's Luther. He's seeing these gross abuses. He's searching the Scriptures himself. And here's Tetzel, whose famous statement was, when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Now, that uh, rhymes in English, but it rhymed in German as well. Here's a picture of the church. It's called uh, All Saints Church, but it was nicknamed the Castle Church. This is the very church, and those are the original doors that Martin Luther nailed the 95 assertions or theses to the door. And, of course, God used him in a mighty way because he understood that neither money nor deeds, nor anything else man could do could satisfy the penalty of sin, which is death. He knew that whenever you mingle works with grace, you are preaching a different gospel. He knew so well, Romans 11 and verse 6, where the apostle writes, but if it, our great salvation, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Either God will save you by grace alone, through Christ alone, or he will not save you at all. And so beyond the sovereign nature of God's grace and the saving nature of God's grace, there is the sufficient nature of God's grace. Roman numeral three, the sufficient nature of God's grace. Again, we read here in verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Now, please note, it does not mean that all men will be saved, but that it is available to all men for anyone who will believe. Because there's a universal need, God has provided a universal remedy. And this statement, by the way, is very similar to what Paul wrote in his first letter to Timothy. Listen to these words. He says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This word desires is the Greek word thelo and it means a deep wish, a deep desire. And God desires, he has a deep wish in his heart for men to be saved. God delights in the salvation of all men. That's why 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 tells us God is delaying his return. Why? Because he wishes for none to perish, but for all to repent. And Paul tells us here, though, that this great salvation that God desires for all men is predicated, notice, on the knowledge of the truth. And of course, not everyone has heard the gospel. Not everyone has a knowledge of the truth. Now, some have heard it and rejected it, but others have never heard it for the first time. But it is in God's heart for men to be saved. And that's the mission of the church. That's not just my mission as a preacher. That's not just the mission of an evangelist or some called missionary. It's the mission of every born-again, blood-bought Christian to share Jesus. That's what he's called us to do. Next week is important. If you haven't led anyone to Christ in the last two years, you come. Because whatever you're doing obviously is not working. You come, but bring someone with you. You say, well, I'll try. Well, try then. Pray. Ask God to use you, but don't sit on your hands. Because God desires all men to be saved. You can't be content simply with your salvation. 
You must be content with other people being saved. You can't say, well, God is my savior and I'm headed for heaven and the rest of the world can hang. No, you are to be caring for the lost people of this world as the Lord is. God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved. And that's what he's underscoring here in verse 11 of this universal provision for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Please underscore, Jesus did not die for a select few, quote unquote, the elect. He died and shed his blood for all men. In theological terms, the grace of God is sufficient to save anyone. But as we'll see in a moment, it is only efficient for those who believe. There are some people who believe in a doctrine called a particular atonement or a limited atonement. Even John Calvin didn't believe the atonement was limited. When my oldest son, who's an attorney, was a student in college, he wrote a paper on why Calvin didn't believe that Jesus died only for the elect. But there are Calvinists today that are more Calvinistic than John Calvin was. Listen, God made a provision for all men. No one at the judgment God of judgment bar of God will be able to say, well, God, even if I wanted to be saved, there was no provision made for me. No, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And the same grace that can save you will be the same grace that will condemn you. 2 Peter 2 and verse 1 is a problematic verse for the limited redemptionist because that great chapter that parallels the book of Jude, a chapter on apostasy, tells us that God, Christ, purchased even those who would deny him. And so God in his mercy who set the penalty has provided a way of escape. And when a man rejects Jesus Christ, he is eternally condemned because he is a sinner and he has rejected God's provision for salvation. It's called unbelief. And this is why we read in John 3, 18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Why? Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Not only will your sin condemn you, your unbelief, your rejection of God's provision will condemn you. The death of Christ is sufficient to save anyone, but it only comes efficient for you when you come in faith. And so if you reject this way of escape, you will suffer the eternal consequences. This is what the Protestant reformers underscored when they spoke of sola fide, that is faith alone. You must believe what God promised, that he is able to do that which he has promised, that by faith alone you will be saved. And if you believe that in some way, shape, or form, human merit helps save, then you're guilty of one of two errors. You're either denying the sufficiency of the cross. What book in the New Testament teaches that? I hope your mind goes to Galatians because Galatians is a book where it doesn't add 500 works or 1,000 works in addition to the cross, a singular work. And there are churches that teach Christ died, was buried, and was raised, but in addition, you must be baptized. In addition, you must join the church. In addition, you must. And that was the Galatian era. They didn't add 100 works. They added one work, namely circumcision. And Paul said to add anything is to nullify the grace of God. You cannot help save yourself. You cannot merit the glory of God because we all fall short of the glory of God. And so because the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. No one here this morning can reason, I'm too good to be saved. No one here this morning can reason, I'm too bad to be saved. No one here this morning can reason, I am unable to be saved because God has made a way of escape. Now, beyond God's sovereign grace and his saving grace and his sufficient grace, I want you to think about God's schooling grace, God's schooling grace, the schooling nature of God's grace. Look, if you will, now at verse 12. He speaks of this grace, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So verse 11 teaches that God's grace 
is provided, it saves us, but verse 12 also teaches it instructs us. The Greek verb here literally means to train a child. And just as we raise our children, we too are to be raised in the grace of God. And please note that the Apostle Paul says it instructs us. Circle that little pronoun, us, in your Bible. He's making a contrast between the grace that is offered and the grace that is received. In verse 11, God's grace is offered to all men. But to whom does God's grace instruct? Only those who receive it, only those who believe, only those who embrace the gift of grace. You know, there's a lot of distorted teaching, sadly, in our day on the grace of God. And some have reasoned, well, look, I'm saved by grace. I'm eternally secure. I met another man this week. And because we live in a culture that is so sexually immoral, he says, I'm going to heaven. I know I shouldn't be living with this woman, but I'm going to heaven because I'm secure. And they think that once you're saved and you're secure, you can live however you wish. Paul deals with that gross error in the end of chapter five and the start of verse six, that the grace of God secures you in such a way that you can live wickedly. He begins, meganoida, perish the thought, God forbid, may it never be that one would think that way. And sadly, we have all these so-called professing born-again Christians who say they are saved, and it doesn't really matter how they live. It's called antinomianism by the Protestant reformers. That is, you can be against the standards, the law of God, because you're saved by grace, and that is certainly not true. Listen, if you hear someone say, I'm saved by grace, but it doesn't matter how I live, you are speaking to someone who has never been saved. You are speaking to that vast multitude of people that Jesus addresses in Matthew 7 who have deceived themselves into thinking that they're okay and he will say, I never knew you, depart from me. In the words of Titus 1.16, Paul wrote to Titus, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. They are not saved, they're only deceived. God's grace, it instructs you if you've had an encounter with it. It it, it schools you in righteous living. And when you have a saving encounter with the grace of God, it will change your life. Now understand, the Roman Catholics during the time of the Protestant Reformation taught you were saved by grace plus works. They have never denied that Christ died, was buried, and was raised from the dead. But what they have died is the sufficiency of that work. They deny sola gratia, sola fide, grace alone, faith alone. And so they have taught that grace plus works provide salvation. Where the scripture would say you're not saved by faith plus works, but you are saved by faith that will work that works are the fruit, they are the byproduct of salvation. And so what did they do? After Luther posted the 95 Theses, some years went by, and in 1542, they called the Council of Trent. And they met over the next two decades, and they produced a document called the Council of Trent. And there's over 100 anathemas in that document that damns to hell any preacher like myself that says you're saved by grace alone through faith alone. You say that was hundreds of years ago. They reaffirmed that document at Vatican I. They reaffirmed the document at Vatican II. They reaffirmed the document at the Council of Cardinals in 2010. They still believe it. Now, thank God for those Roman Catholics who through their own personal study of the scripture or maybe hearing some preacher. We've seen so many Roman Catholics in New England through search the scriptures, find Jesus as Lord, and I'm grateful for that. But they have met the living God, but they are going against Catholic doctrine. And it was for this reason that tens of thousands of people were executed because they went against the teaching of Rome. So faith alone results in justification followed by good works, where in contradistinction the Roman Catholic churches teach faith plus works results in justification. 
or to say it differently, good works do not procure your salvation, but they will indeed proceed from your salvation. And so the grace of God that saves a person changes the whole life. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, he's a new person, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Now, please notice from verse 12 that God's grace instructs us in at least two ways. For the grace of God has appeared, he says, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And so negatively, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires. Ungodliness is living as if God didn't exist. And I have been impressed in reading Paul's letters because over and over and over again, he'll tell the people of God, don't live like the heathen. Negatively, it teaches you also to deny worldly desires. And worldly desires can be summarized into three categories. John speaks of all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. What I want you to see is that if you've not been instructed by God's grace, it just means you haven't been saved by God's grace. The grace of God that brings us, true believers, salvation, teaches you and instructs you to deny ungodliness in worldly desires. But not only does it have a negative instruction, it has a positive instruction. Look at the verse. Instructing us to deny ungodliness in worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. First, he tells us that God's grace will teach us to live sensibly. To live sensibly is to have a proper relationship with oneself. God's grace tells you to say yes to the things that you should say yes to. It also teaches us to live righteously. This describes your relationship with your neighbor. You treat them in a just, fair, and honest way. But also, the grace of God that brings salvation instructs us to live godly. That deals in the vertical aspect. It speaks of your relationship to God, to live holy and reverently and separated before him. So God's grace operates in three spheres, inward with yourself, outward with your neighbor, upward with the living God. It empowers you to live in this present age. It invades your relationship with yourself, with others, and with the living God. It teaches you to live inward, outward, and upward, sensibly, righteously, and godly. And please underscore in your thinking that God's grace is available in this present age. God doesn't simply save you for heaven and then you sweat it out on your own. He gives you grace so that you can flesh out the call that he has laid on your life. And so there's no challenge, no problem that you're facing today that God's grace is not sufficient for. Hold your finger here for a moment and turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, Paul, if you remember, in this chapter had received a vision from the Lord where God pulled back the curtain of heaven and he gives him a glimpse of glory. And he gives him a peek of what it's like on the other side and it's incredible. In fact, God wants to make sure that he keeps his mouth shut about it. Listen to verse seven. There are some things God has revealed about heaven. There are some things he hasn't yet revealed. And we're told in verse seven, and because of the surpassing greatness, 2 Corinthians 12, seven, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Now, there are different words that are rendered thorn, but the particular Greek word that is used here for thorn, if you've been to Israel, I've collected a few before, it refers to those three or four inch thorns. In fact, they said they would use them in the early days to collect them and they would kindle a fire with it. And they created not some little splinter, but excruciating pain. And of course, God does not cause this. Satan does, but God allows it. Verse 8, concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. 
You see, it is in weakness that we find the strength of God. And so Paul can say in verse 10, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Think about it. When God saved you, how did he save you? He saved you in weakness. You came helpless. You came bankrupt. You admitted that you're unable to do anything to add to your salvation, that Christ totally provided the way for you. Well, God not only wants you to be saved by grace, God wants you to be sanctified by grace. God doesn't save you one way and grow you another way. He grows you the same way he saves you. And so Paul will say to the Corinthians, as therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did you receive Christ? In bankruptcy, in total dependence upon the finished work of Christ. How are you to grow in him in the same way? Are you walking in him this week as the same way you were saved? Ask yourself that question. As I receive Christ Jesus the Lord, am I walking him in that way? Did you have time alone with God in his book? Did you have any time alone with God in prayer? If you didn't, then you're not depending on him. You're depending on your own strength, your own ability, instead of the living God who wants to live this life in and through you. Now, I don't know what kind of heartache, what kind of sin, what kind of impossibility you may feel like you are facing. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, you'll have philipsis. But there is grace that is available for this present age. And God is clear that there's no problem that is too big. We, we tend to measure problems, and this is a small problem, this is a big problem. There's no such thing as a big problem to an omnipotent God. Everything is small to him. And either we're not willing to access ourselves to that grace or through rebellion and broken fellowship with God, we're refusing to obey the Lord. Look, we would have so many better marriages in evangelicalism if we had couples who depended on growing grace. There's not only saving grace, but there's what James calls growing grace. Peter will say, grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ Jesus. If they were dependent on the Lord, on their knees, feeding on the scripture, discussing it together, their marriages would be transformed. They would be raising different kinds of children if they had that kind of growing grace. You see, the problem is not God. The problem is with us, and God wants us to avail ourselves to his grace. But what happens if you don't? The scripture is clear. Given enough time, you will become bitter. Listen to the words from the writer to the Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. Some of you grew up in homes that were terrible, a terrible home environment. Uh, maybe you had parents who literally sexually abused you. I've heard it all in a pastor's study. Some of you grew up with parents who were drunks. Some of you grew up with parents who had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and they were more interested in their boyfriend and their, or their girlfriend than they were in you. And you've just con concluded, well, this is just the way I am. I'm, I'm codependent, I'm insufficient. All the mental nonsense, psychological dribble that is coming to the church. I'm a mentally damaged, physically abused, emotional cripple. I'm just gonna have to go through life this way. And God says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You can cut a new generation. You can be different from the kind of home that you grew up in. God shouts from heaven this morning, my grace is sufficient. And it's actually in weakness that you will find strength. Job said the Lord gave. Well, just about anybody can say that. But he also said the Lord took away. Well, most Christians can say that. But then he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. It takes grace to say that. When heartache comes, that seemingly is beyond imagination. It takes grace to say that. And he reminds us if we come short of the grace of God, what typically happens? We become bitter. 
And bitter people are like poison, they defile other people. And so the same sun that melts the ice, hardens the clay, the same grace that can save you is to be the grace that sustains you and grows you. There's sovereign grace, there's saving grace, there's sufficient grace, there's schooling grace. But there's another aspect, there's securing grace. So let's think about the securing grace of God. In verse 13, we are to be looking for what? The blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. One of these days, perhaps today, we're going to meet the Lord. He'll come either and take you in death. One of his angels will carry you into heaven as illustrated in Luke 16. Or he'll take you by rapture. But either by death or rapture, one of these days you're going to see him. And this is the hope. It's the word elpida. It's not like our English word hope. It has a whole lot more concrete and steel in it. It's not indicating something that may or may not happen. It is a sure and certain promise that God will fulfill in the future. It speaks of something that is absolutely certain. And notice that he modifies it with the word blessed. It's called the blessed hope. Why is it called the blessed hope? Well, there are many passages that elucidate that for us. Let me remind you, I'll give you four reasons why. Number one, it's a comforting hope. It's a comforting hope. Listen to what Paul told the church at Thessalonica. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with, in the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He just said that some of you have lost folks who are asleep, that is their body, but he'll bring back with him, because absent from the body, present with the Lord, he'll bring back with him those who've fallen asleep. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will come out of the grave first. The spirit in heaven will be reunited with that body in the grave, and the twinkling of an eye will be changed. This mortality will put on immortality. This perishable will put on imperishable, because this body is not suited to walk on streets of gold. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The scripture teaches that when you see your loved ones, you will recognize them, just like Moses and Elijah were recognizable on the Mount of Transfiguration. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Some of you have loved ones whom you deeply miss. But if they knew the Lord like you did, you're gonna be gathered together with them. It's a comforting hope. And so Christ said this to his downtrodden disciples in the upper room. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. Mansions was excellent for the 17th century. It means something totally different today. It's not like, well, Bob's got this mansion over here, and Fred's got a mansion over here, and Joel has one over here. No, it's the Father's house and just like if you grew up in a healthy home, you like to come to your home and there's many rooms in the house where the family gathers. Well, the family of God will have a multiplicity of rooms. It will be in the Father's house. There are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also and when you realize how temporary this life is, that it's but a vapor that appears for a moment and then disappears, it brings great encouragement. I can stand just about anything I might face in light of the fact of what God has for me for all of eternity. It's a comforting hope. It's an encouraging hope. It's a purifying hope. Listen to these words in 1 John 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Think about it. If you absolutely knew Jesus was coming back this afternoon, would you make some changes? Then make them. Because one of these days he's going to come and you don't know when he's coming. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. You say, Pastor Carl, I'm just so glad I'm going to heaven. As long as I go to heaven, I'll be happy to go there second class. I'll be happy when I get there. No, you won't. 
you won't be satisfied. You will be disappointed when you see him. The scripture says you will shrink back in shame. You know why I want to live a holy life and a pleasing life to the Lord? Because I don't want to disappoint him. I'm not afraid that he's going to punish me. He's propitiated. That means all of his wrath has been poured out. He's not angry with me anymore. But when I see him, I don't want to disappoint him. That's the difference between law and love. Listen, he is coming one of these days, and when you focus on that, it changes your behavior. It has a purifying effect on you. I mean, 50 years from now, most of the people who are listening to this message, wherever they are in the world, will be gone. And what will really matter to you? Will it be the money you've earned? Will it be the house or houses maybe you've acquired, the notoriety you've achieved? the degrees you've earned, none of those things will mean anything to you when someone surrounds your casket as hundreds have here over the decades. The only thing that will be of meaning to you will be the grace of God. And Paul wants you to have this perspective of this blessed hope. And by the way, here in verse 13, this disassembles Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness who say Jesus is only a man. Look at it. We are to be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Those who deny the deity and the equality of God the Son to God the Father, they have to deny this verse of Scripture. In the Greek New Testament, there are certain endings where this word can only modify this word and absolutely nothing else. It's clear in English. It's crystal clear in the Greek text that God and Savior modifies here Christ Jesus. Look, he's not just a good way to heaven. He's not just the best way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. And if he's not the only way to heaven, then he's no way to heaven because he said he is the only way to heaven. And if he's not the only way to heaven, then he's either deceived or he's a deceiver. That would make him a liar, a sinner, and he can save no one. But I'm here to tell you there is salvation in no one else, no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And this is precisely what the Protestant reformers meant by solus Christos, Christ alone. He is the only mediator for salvation in between you and God until he comes for you. So we're looking for the appearing of our great God and Savior. We're looking for solus Christos. Christ alone, who, notice verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Circle two words. Circle the word from and the word for here in verse 14. Christ redeemed us from something and he's purifying us for something. Christ with his own blood redeemed you. He bought you back from Satan's slave market of sin. Why? So that you can be holy and pure. Some of you were saved from a wicked, vile, immoral lifestyle. Some of you were drunkards. Some of you were lesbians. Some of you were homosexuals. Some of you were drug addicts. And we tend to want to applaud those kinds of testimonies. Oh, we want to bring somebody in who has a dramatic testimony. That's the person we want to bring onto the platform. And yet some of you never experienced those things. But God saved you maybe at five or six as a sinner, and he kept you from those things. That too is God's grace, and in many ways, that is a more powerful testimony of what God kept you from. And may I remind you, it took no less of the blood of Christ to save the drunkard and the adulterer than it did a five-year-old girl who comes under conviction for lying. And what does this grace do? The scripture says it makes you zealous for what is good. I mean, when you look at the cross, all of our excuses dissolve. And if you do not have a zealousness in your heart, it means one of two things. Either you, A, have never been saved by grace, or B, you are no longer growing in grace. 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And someone who is not growing in grace will become apathetic. They'll lose their passion that maybe they had as a new Christian. But understand, you're either going forward or you're going back, there's no such thing as standing still, not in the Christian life. 
So this is a blessed hope. It's a hope that comforts. It's a hope that encourages. It's a hope that purifies. And it is a certain hope. It's a definitive hope. Paul can tell us to look for the appearing of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. Why? Because he has secured us for heaven. We're not saved by grace and then kept by works. That's gross error. The same grace that saves us is the grace that secures us. And so Paul can tell the church at Philippi, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so notice how he concludes this discourse, verse 15. These things, he says, Titus, these things, speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Now, wait a minute. Titus was not an apostle. How could he speak with such authority? Because he had the word of God, and so do you. Why can you share the gospel with an individual with authority where you can tell them that you can be delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? You can be delivered from the wrath of God into the eternal pleasure of the Lord because you have the word of God. It's what the Protestant reformer said on the front of my pulpit, sola Scriptura. The final authority is not some external piece of literature that some pope or church or preacher comes up with. It is Scripture alone. And they underscored that Scripture was self-interpreting. Unlike the Roman church that taught the magisterium that you couldn't read the Scripture for yourself, and they still teach this, because you're just an ignorant nobody. They alone can read it for you. And what matters is not what you think the Bible says. What matters is what they say the Bible says. And of course, the Scripture interprets itself. It does not mean that there are passages that are difficult. It's what we call the purposecuity of Scripture, one of the great teachings of the Reformation. That is, that Scripture can be clear. It doesn't mean that there are not some passages that are milk and some that are meat. It doesn't mean that God doesn't raise up teachers and pastors to expound the Word of God. But ultimately, it says that you can read the Scripture and examine it for yourself and come to a right understanding of true Christian doctrine. And so these are indeed the five solas of the Reformation, that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Now, I realize there are some here that maybe you don't understand all this, but if you understand that you're a bankrupt sinner, and that you can do nothing to merit heaven, and that the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation, which is defined that Christ died, was buried, and was raised, if you're willing to put your faith where God put your sin on the Lord Jesus, he'll save you in an instant, and he will change you. You say, well, pastor, I've already been saved then I would invite you to continue to grow. James will write, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Not only do we need saving grace, we need growing grace. And we need to continually, habitually, moment by moment, depend upon him. Now, our Father, we thank you for this portion of scripture that we have been privileged to read this morning. I pray today for someone who is here, who is unsure of their salvation as they came in, but they understand what the Lord Jesus did, that it's not a Jesus plus plan, that you will either save that individual all by themselves without any help from them, or you will not save them at all. Thank you because Jesus did what he did, that whoever will call on his name will be saved. Help someone listening wherever they may be in the world to simply say, Lord Jesus, save me. And our Father, for those who have done that, give them the growing grace to make it public, to obey you through the symbol of baptism. And for those who have even done that, may we walk in humility moment by moment, day by day, depending on this grace that we need to grow. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. Would you stand?
We'll sing a hymn of invitation. If you've never made a public confession of your faith, I want to invite you to do that this morning. You say, what does that involve? Leaving your seat, coming to the front row. We won't ask you to give a speech. But your coming will be saying, I'm not ashamed of Christ. And if you're not ashamed of him, I won't be ashamed to baptize you. You say, preacher, I've been baptized. I've been saved. Do you have a church home? Every Christian needs one. It's disobedient to be in a prolonged status where you're not a member of a New Testament church. If not this church, find another Bible-believing church, but don't float. But if we can be that church for you, we would welcome you. We invite you to come as well. Matt, lead us. If you have a decision to make, meet me here in the front.